But let me just explain to you what we are doing here. Of course, the tragedy is still very raw. We're still completely <clears throat> can't get it out of our minds. We miss Russell desperately. And the family have displayed tremendous strength. It has been an inspiration to myself to see the boys, especially in short three times a day, governing with a minyan, saying Kaddish, and also just all of the family. Sharon, Eliana, the boys, your grandmother as well, just a, a pillar of strength for, for all of us to, to just watch. And we wish you, please God, you should find a lot of strength in the support that you have around you at this very, very difficult time. But we felt it appropriate to come together to learn some Torah, because that's what we do as Jews. In the face of tragedy, we get together. We come together as a community. And Torah is so important because we actually are going to learn this evening that it's one of the pillars on which the world stands on. But we also learn Mishnah. Why do we learn Mishnah? Because Mishnah spells out the word Neshama, soul. And according to Jewish tradition, when you learn Mishnah, it elevates the soul. But I want to take a step back because I asked Howard the level of people coming here this evening. What background level are they on? He said, everyone's on their own level, we don't know. So I'm going to assume you know nothing, right? It, please forgive me if I am a few steps ahead. But can anyone share with, with, with the group, what is a Mishnah? Where did it come from? A drop of background. Don't be shy. Thank you, Dr. Kabbalovitz. Thank you. Torah Shabal Peh. But again, for the people who didn't know what Mishnah means, they probably don't know what Torah Shabal Peh means either. So let me... The oral law that was written down. The oral law. The oral tradition. So let's just give you a brief history lesson in three minutes. Please humor me and listen carefully. The Almighty goes up Mount Sinai. Sorry, Moses goes up Mount Sinai. And he receives two things from, he receives two things from God. He receives two things. He receives the Torah... The one that Howard likes shows off his muscles when he's on the bimmer, you know that one. Yeah, he receives the Torah, the written scroll. Additionally, there was also the oral tradition. Now, this oral tradition, what was it necessary for? Why didn't God just write everything down? Why was it not all in the book in the first place? If it's so important, put it in the book, right? The way I tell my class this in JFS, and don't worry, I'm not going to do it here this evening, I, I wave a five-pound note in front of them. And I say, I want you to write down instructions on how to do up my shoelace. Imagine I've never done up my shoelace before. And you're going to teach me by writing down instructions. And then I say, whoever can read out their instructions and, get, and gets it perfect, wins my five pounds. You've never seen teenagers so work, work so hard in their life. They start <laughs> scribbling and they write notes vigorously. This is how you do up your shoelace. Take the two strings, fold them. And, and then I get a volunteer to come up and he listens to the instructions. He never is ever able to do up his shoelaces. Why? Because some things you learn, not by reading it, but by watching other people do it, by learning from example, from seeing people practice it. And it's the same with Judaism. You don't just learn to do up your shoelaces because you read it in an instruction book. How did you learn to do up your shoelaces? Your mum showed you, your dad showed you, your uncle showed you, your grandpa showed you. You learn by way of example. And it's the same with the Torah. Some of the laws are written, but some of them are much more than that. They are lived, and we learn them from example. And for over a thousand years, the Mishnah was completely oral. It was passed down generation, 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 until the destruction of the temple, when all of a sudden Jews go all over the world, right? Essie's family go to the Far East, right? Dr. Kopelovitz's family go to, to, to Poland, right? We all start going all over the world. You'll find Jews in every country in the world. But the problem is, when Jews go everywhere, we're worried the traditions are going to be lost. So along comes an amazing rabbi who saves the whole Jewish world, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, and he writes it down in an amazing set of books called the Mishnah. Now, the Mishnah summarizes everything in its six sections, each section dealing with a different aspect of Jewish life. You've got Zra'im, seeds, deals with blessings, agriculture. You've got Moe, deals with festivals, Pesach, Shabbat. Nashim, deals with laws concerning men and women and interpersonal relationships, marriage, divorce. You've got Kodshim, holy things, temple stuff, Taharat, purity, Nazikin, damages, law. You stole my things. You built your things in my land. And that encompasses all of Jewish life. Within one of those sections, there's a book called Pirkei Avot. And that's what we're going to learn this evening. So just to give you some context, what are we doing here? What are we learning? Where does it come from? We're learning Pirkei Avot. Now, I've been set a high challenge to try and go through the whole of Pirkei Avot in four weeks. Is it, re is it realistic? Well, of course, anything's realistic if you want to try and do it. We're going to try and do our best. And if at any point you've had enough of board, please feel free to leave. No one is uh, obligated to stay. 
But uh, what we're going to try and do is get through some of it this evening. You can then finish learning the parak at home between this week and next week. And then next week we'll start with the Homework. second parak. Homework, that absolutely. <laughs> Chase will tell you all about that. He knows a huge deal about that. Not. Okay, so, um, so that is my introduction. And also, can I please make a request? Please ask questions. Please heckle. Please uh, challenge. If you don't like what I say, don't agree with what I say, do not sit quietly. Um, please feel free to heckle at any point. <laughs> so, what is Pirkei Avot? The translation, it's ethics of our fathers, the chapters of our fathers. The way I would describe Pirkei Avot, it is an ethical will. You know, when somebody leaves this world, they leave behind possessions to their descendants. But an ethical will is they leave behind moral instructions for living. The type of person they want their children to be, the type of character they were, that is an ethical will. I would say that Pirkei Avot can only be described as an ethical will of the Jewish people. It is the great statements of all the rabbis over many centuries. And unlike all the other books of the Mishnah, which are very intricate and deals with law, how high should your sukkah be, how big should your piece of matzah be, how, many, how do you light your Shabbat candles, etc., etc., this is just giving you life advice. And what's amazing is if you open up Pirkei Avot, it's as relevant then as it is now, as you'll see this evening. It's quite remarkable. Every single line of the Mishnah is precious. In fact, growing up on Shabbat afternoon, my father would pull all of us, stop us playing, and for 20 minutes make us sit down and go through this great works. So it's really worth going through. Incidentally, you'll find it in every siddur. Why? Because Jews learn it on Shabbat afternoon. For those who have ever come to Mincha, Shabbat afternoon, a few minutes after the Amidah, we sit and we read a chapter a week in the summer between Pesach and all the way to Rosh Hashanah. So that is a little bit of, of Pirkei Avot and, um, and a little bit of an introduction. So with that introduction, I want to begin learning with you the first Mishnah. Now, as a teacher, I try to make things a little bit interactive. And I brought with me this evening a very, very special prop. Somebody asked me if I thought it was Purim. I was bringing a Megillah. This is not a Megillah. But this is a, a very special prop, which I think is very important for the first Mishnah. But before I open this and explain to you what this is, can I have a volunteer just to read the first Mishnah in Hebrew or in English? Either is fine. Any volunteers? Come on. Right, 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 go for it. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Mishnah 1. Can I trouble you for a glass of water? Thanks so much. Go for it. Mission one. Head on speaking English. <laughs> <laughs> Did you record that? I'd let you do it in French, but that would really be a problem. Yeah, if you do it in French, I'll get it. Dr. Kopilov is going to read it for us. Go for it, Dr. Kopilov. Thank you so much. <laughs> So also the Harshur. The Harshur is a Canaan. It's a Canaan in the beam. In the beam of the Sarburo, Nanshiak Vesagdara. Stop there. English, please. English, please. Moses received the Torah at Sinai and transmitted it to Yeshua. Or Joshua. Yeah. Joshua to the elders and the elders to the prophets and the prophets to the men of the great assembly. They said three things. Be patient. Pause, pause, pause. We'll get to that bit in a minute. Right, this Mishnah is the very first Mishnah in Pirkei which is telling us what? It's telling us where this all comes from. In other words, the chain. There was Moses, Joshua, etc., etc., and it goes through the chain. And I want to explain to you that this isn't just a history lesson. This is present day. And I'm going to explain to you with the use of my two volunteers over here. Stand up, guys. Right? I'm going to ask you to hold this side, right? And you can hold it's it. Upside down. It's upside down. We'll do it the right way up. Yeah, although in some lessons they wouldn't notice, but... Okay, all right, hold it. Okay, so... Okay, fine. So, can everyone see? Hold it up high. You've got... I'm going to stand over here while they start opening it. You've got the very beginning, you've got Hashem, right? Hashem gives Moses the Torah in 1312 BCE. That's 3,333 years ago. Keep on walking that way. Um, and I apologize for those people who can't see. Then you've got Joshua. Right, pause a second, pause. Joshua is the next leader after, after Moses. Then Pinchas, then Eli, then Shmuel. You've heard of all these people. King David, everyone heard of King David? Yeah. Right, this is how the tradition goes. Keep on going. Okay, you're doing a great job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, then we've got all the way to stop. Pause, Max. Apologies to the people sitting over here. You can see through it. Then it goes to all the prophets. Achia, Eliyahu, Elisha, Yoshua. Keep on going. Amos. Yeshaya, Micha. Now, I suggest you start walking and um, like rolling it like you would, because otherwise you'll end up at the back of the garden. Yeah, roll it towards us. 
The scroll goes all the way. You now get what pause, pause. While he's rolling it backwards, let me just tell you. You now get to the rabbis after Ezra. That's the end of the of the prophets. You now start getting to Shimon HaTzadik, who was the one of the leaders in the time of the temple. Answer, so you've gone what? how many years? We've gone, gone from 575, 1312 BCE, all the way down. And I'll give out some sheets of this. I've printed this as well. You've gone 1500 years. Well, yeah. not quite yet, 1500 years. You've gone about 500 years, right? You've gone from... That's what that's all So you go all the way from God to Moses, years. to Joshua, to Pinchas, Eli. Now, Eli, we're talking about a thousand years before the Common Era. Samuel was 889 before the Common Era. You go all the way down, keep on rolling back towards him, all towards him. You stop, you stop moving, right? Um, <laughs> then you start going to the prophets. You start going to Ezra. Then you start getting to the rabbis of the time of the Mishnah. Remember we spoke about Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi? We're going to get to him over here. You've got Rav and Shmuel. Then he's there. Sh- oh, you've gone past Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, right? He's never there. He's at the bottom. Where is he? Here we have Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi over here. Then you have the Rabbanim in the times of the Gemara, 420 CE. That's 420 of the Common Era. That's roughly 1,500 years ago. This is the, coming towards the end of the Gemara. Can I ask you just to come and just turn a bit this way so that people on that side can see as well? I think Mr. Crystal can't see clear. Can you see over that? Yeah? yeah? Keep on turning. Then it keeps on going. Keep on turning, keep on turning. Yeah? This chart goes all the way through, generation to generation. We're now the rabbis at the end of the time of the Gemara. After the Tanaim, we get to the Amorite period. This is in Babylon. And then it carries on through, even after the destruction of the temple, right well after the times of Babylon, all the way to the times of the Savarayim, and then the Gaonic period. That's like a thousand years ago. Then after that, right, tell me, read out a name. What name are we up to, roughly? Ramar. Right? We're now ready. We're now ready about five, 500 years ago. Move around. This is like going through generation, generation. The Vilna gone. This is only 200 years ago. Now, the Vilna gone. Slow down. His rabbi, pause that. His rabbi was a rabbi called Rechaim of Velozhin. You heard of Rechaim of Velozhin? He was the founder of modern-day yeshiva world. Rabbi Shroff Salanta, he lived in the 19th, 18th century, Rabbi Zunzel mm-hmm. of Salanta. Dain Lopian, who was a rabbi of Edgeware, yeah, his know. rabbi was from Elia Lopian, pause a second, yeah. whose rabbi was Shrimp Kazisal of Chelm, whose rabbi was Zunzel of Salanta, Rabbi Shroff Salanta, Rabbi Chaim Velozhin. Within a few generations, you're back to like the main rabbis of 200 years ago, and then the final one, over here, you've got Rabbi Yoni Golka, because I learned from Dain Lopian <laughs> many, many things. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, you can close that. Okay, well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. <laughs> but you know what? For those people who want to look at that more closely, I printed it off a few times. For me, this document is, 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 is more than just a prop. It's a masterful connection that connects you all the way back to Moses and God on Mount Sinai. Don't think this is just some heebie-jeebie old text thousands of years ago, yeah, not relevant to me in 2019. It is directly relevant to you. And that's why it's the opening mission of Pippi Alvot. Because don't just think that all the ethics and morals, we do it because it's nice, it's polite, it's refined. We do it because God told us to. And because it finds its origins back on Sinai. Now, I've got a question for you. Who gave God, what, 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 the opening line says, God, it says Moses received the Torah from Sinai. Question is, what does that mean? <coughs> Moses didn't receive the Torah from Sinai, he received it from God. Why does it say he received it from Sinai? Yes, Any it suggestions? Says at Sinai. Well, the Hebrew, it says Mi really, it's Misi, like the Mem. Mem, the Mem, Mem is from Sinai. The Hebrew is actually oh. from Sinai. Yeah, this is at Sinai. The translation, just because that was what we're yeah. translating it. What does it mean he received it from Sinai? <laughs> Go on, Kathy. That was Hashem's house? Well, the Hashem's house was really the temple, actually. This was in the wilderness. But I, I, it's not a bad guess, because his presence was there at the time. I'll give you a beautiful answer, a very simple answer. What do you know about Mount Sinai? Was it big or small? Small. It was the smallest mountain. It was very, very small. It was a symbol of what? Humility. Absolute humility. Now, we sometimes make a mistake with humility. We think humility means being very kind of like shy and not speaking up who you are and what you represent. Humility is not that at all. Really, what does humility mean in Judaism? Humility means recognizing you have talents, but they're God's given talents. They're not your own talents, and they're your talents to use for a purpose and for a reason. And therefore, before you are able to really learn Torah, 
You need to recognize who you are and where your talents come from. So therefore it says that God received the Torah from Sinai. There's a very famous story with the great Rab- Dain Abramsky. Dr. Kovlovitz, you may remember him? Yeah, of course, right? <laughs> Even though he lived about 100 years ago, Dr. Kovlovitz knew him. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, Dayan Abramsky was this one of the chief Dayanim on the London Beth Din, and he was once called to the High Court. Why was he called to the High Court? Because there was a case, there was a case against slaughter, Jewish ritual slaughter, and he was brought as an expert witness in defense of ritual slaughter. And the, he was being cross-examined, and the, 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 the lawyer examining him said, is it true that you are the leading authority of Jewish law in this country? And he said, no, I'm the leading authority in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> to which the judge turned to him and said, uh, Rabbi, aren't Jews supposed to be very modest? He said, yes, but I'm under oath, Your Honor. <laughs> right? So we, talk, we talk about modesty. There's modesty and there's misplaced modesty. And, um, and, and this is really what the Mishnah was getting at. That you need to be able... Right, the sages explain why was it given on Sinai to teach you humility, to teach you not to have low self-esteem. That's a mistake, but to recognise who you are and where you come from. Now, second part of the Mishnah, Michael, read it for me, please. That in the English, the second, the last time you get the first Mishnah, they said three things. They said three, three things: be patient in the administration of justice, raise many uh, disciples, and make a fence around the world. Okay, so I want to talk about those three really important things. Three pieces of advice. Be patient in judgment. We live in the instant generation, right? Instantaneous generation. We were discussing this a little bit on the train yesterday. If it's too hot, you turn up the AC. If it's too cold, you turn down the heating. You don't like the track, you change the CD. Or you go on Spotify and choose another playlist. You don't like the car, you get a new car. You don't well, like the rabbi, you get a new rabbi. Absolutely, you don't like the woman, get a new woman. Yeah, we live in a society, it's a throwaway culture. Judaism, we recognize that's not the way. That's absolutely not our way. Be patient, be deliberate in judgment, be thought out, especially in casting judgment on others. And any decision that you make in life should never be made in haste. Think about it, plan it out, seek advice, and um, and make sure you see all the options before you. The second piece of advice from the Mishnah is raise many disciples. The Torah is not telling us each and every one of us needs to go to education. You don't need to become a teacher by standing in a classroom. Each and every one of us in our own lifetime has the ability to be a role model, to be a teacher. I mean, look at Russell and the influence that he has had on the lives of so many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Look at the shiver, over 3,500 people walking through the doors of St. John's Wood in one week. Look at the turnout here this evening in his honour, right? Myself and Dina were saying we could only dream when we would give a share in the synagogue, we would have a quarter of the amount of people showing up. And, and I think that's really what it means when it says... Raise Many Disciples is about being a role model. You know, there was an amazing story of Aaron Fernstein. Aaron Fernstein is a Jew. He's now in his late 90s. He lives in Malden Mills in Massachusetts in America. He was a self-made multi-multi-millionaire. He built this huge textile industry, this huge business. And in 1995, in December the 11th, 1995, there was a huge fire in his factory. The whole factory got ruined. And he had a decision to make. And the sensible decision of then a man in his 70s is to take a 300 million pound insurance payout and retire. But he didn't make that decision. He said, we're going to rebuild the factory right here. We're not going to go off to China and India. We're going to do it right here because there are hundreds of families who depend on me for their income. Hundreds of workers. Whether that was a wise business decision, I don't know. But he became a hero in America. And this unbelievable symbol of Kiddush Hashem, of somebody who was a real role model. And this idea of being a Kiddush Hashem is something so pertinent and relevant to each and every one of us. You know, there's a beautiful story. There's a man in Golders Green called Ronnie um, um, Halibard. Ronnie Halibard is a, is a very nice man, a religious man, a working man. He's a solicitor. And one Friday afternoon, he was traveling home on the train. And he was very tired. It was the end of a long week. It was Friday afternoon. He was nodding off. And he noticed opposite him, there was a lady also nodding off. And suddenly they arrived at Golders Green, and the, the, they announced the next station is Golders Green. And all of a sudden, this woman woke up in a big rush. She jumped off the train, and she left her bag on the train. Sounds familiar, right? She left her bag on the train. She looks behind, the doors close, and the last image in her mind is a religious Jew walking towards her bag. 
Mr. Hannibal picks up the handbag, takes it off with him the next station, with the intention of finding this woman. It's Er Shabbat, he goes home, kids, family, big rush, has Shabbat. The minute Shabbat goes out, Saturday evening, he opens the bag, he finds this woman's phone number, contact details. He phones her, she's so thrilled, the bag's been found. Can I come and pick it up? Yes, within 20 minutes, she's at his front door. He hands her the bag, she hands him a bottle of kosher wine. And he said, that's so nice of you. You didn't need to buy me a gift, but tell me, let me ask you a question. When did you buy me a bottle of kosher wine? You know, it's Saturday night, Kosher Kingdom's closed, all the Jewish stores are closed. When on earth did you buy me this wine? She said, the moment I got off that train and I saw a religious Jew was walking towards my bag, I knew no question I was going to get that bag back. And I went and bought the wine there and then because I knew that that bag was coming back to me. Beautiful story. And an example of how each and every one of us can be a role model, can try and make a difference, can try and live uh, and be a Kiddush Hashem in any way possible. So that, that, that's the second teaching. The final teaching of the Mishnah is to make a fence around the Torah. Now, this is something I get the whole time, day in, day out, both in St. John's Wood and in JFS. Rabbi, really? Shabbat? I can't touch my car keys? I can't pick up a pen? Does God care? Honestly? Muksa, right? We have a concept called Muksa. Muksa mm-hmm. means that on Shabbat, not only can you not go on your phone and make a phone call, you're not allowed to touch your phone, right? It's based on this Mishnah, making a fence around the Torah. What does this mean? What is the point? And the answer really is very simple. Making a fence around the Torah is the idea that if you want to protect something precious, you put safeguards around it. If a family go on holiday and they rent a beautiful uh, villa on a, on a, in a beautiful cliff with young children, they're going to make sure there's a fence around the cliff edge. They're not going to let the children play football Right? Because they're going to make a fence to make sure it's safe. Right? Exactly the same idea when it comes to spirituality. We have this concept, make a fence around the Torah, because we believe the Torah is divine, we believe that the laws are divine, and we believe they're important. And therefore, we make certain boundaries, and that's what it means to make a fence around the Torah. It's like, you know, if, if, if you have an electric fence, you don't want to get close to it. You want to make sure there's, there's a safeguard to take it seriously, uh, and that's something that people often scorn about, but that is what it is about. Okay, so we've learned Mishnah 1. How are we doing for time? <laughs> okay, tell me, tell me how we're doing for time. Mishnah 2. Let's go for Mishnah 2. Eliana, can I ask you to read for us in English? Mishnah 2, please. I have to pick on you. Sorry, school teacher, I see you get on that phone. Sorry, just in structural terms, are you saying to me there are 18? Or this is the first? This is 18 in the first parak. We won't get through all of these tonight. Are there are four Frakken. There's no way you're going to get through that. No, six Frakken. Six Frakken. Six. There's no way you're going to get through that. We'll get through. Where do we get through? Six. Good. Go. Okay. Go for it. Okay. Just measuring here. Keep on going. Keep on going. Okay, so this was Shimon Hatzadik, and his big statement, and he made lots of statements, but this was something that he said that he was famous for. He said, the world stands on three things, and these are three pillars that you need to remember, and we're going to talk about why he chose these three. What were the three? Torah, Jewish law, Avodah, service of God, in other words, prayer, basically, or in temple times, sacrificial offerings, and lastly, Chesed, acts of human kindness. Now, why does he choose three things? Not so, when you say he's the last of the men of the Great Assembly, you say he's the last of the men of the Temple? Or so, the Great Assembly, there was, a, a, there was a, something called the Anshay Knesset Haggadolah. The Anshay Knesset Haggadolah were the men of the Great Assembly in Temple times. And he was, was one of the, of the last generation. Who did this? The Anshay Knesset Haggadolah wrote the Amida. Like, yeah, they, they wrote the Amida. All, the, all the dubbing that we do is Correct, the correct. They established many of the things that we do to this day. He said the following. He said the world stands on these three, three things. And, and, and I think it's important to understand why were these three so compelling? And I had a beautiful idea. Torah, Avodah, Gemilas, Chasadim. In each of us have three dimensions to our life. We have ourself, we have other people around us, and we have God. Right? And these three things are a paradigm for those three relationships in our life. And then furthermore, it goes even deeper. We have three ways of re- interacting with the world we live in. We have our thought process, we have our speech, and we have our actions. And therefore he said, you act on yourself, how? With your thoughts. That's very much, that's very much personal, it's you and your thoughts. You interact with God through speech, 
prayer, and you interact with others through your actions. And you know, it's an interesting thing. Does anyone remember from the High Holy Days, what are the three things that we say are going to save you? Right. You're top of the class, Dr. Top of it. <laughs> Absolutely. Teshuvah, Tefillah, and Tzedakah. Teshuvah means repentance. Tefillah means prayer. And Tzedakah means charity. And those relate to those three things. Teshuvah, right, that's through Torah learning. Tefillah, that's through prayer, through speech. And Sadaka, that's through actions, how you're going to help other people on a practical level. And it goes even further, he tries to connect this to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Abraham was known for his chesed, right? He was a man of action. Yitzhak was known for Gevura, he was a man of prayer. And Yaakov was a man of Torah, he was somebody who's, who was very involved in Torah learning. And therefore we see this idea of how those three have gone even further. Okay, let's move on to Mishnah... Three. I think we can finish Mishnah two. Some water. Some water. Oh, I'm okay. Don't worry, I'm alright. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Mishnah three. Marcus, go for it. Antigonus, a man of Socher, received the oral tradition from Shimon, the righteous. Pause. So Antigonus, who was he? He was the man of Socher. He was like the mayor of the town. He was the most um, uh, established man, the person from this town. He was a very well-known figure. And he was a disciple of Shimon HaTzadik, who we spoke about in the previous Mishnah. Go for it. He used to say, do not be like servants who serve the master in the expectation of receiving a reward, but be like servants who serve the master without the expectation of receiving a reward, and let the fear of heaven be upon you. So this is a very interesting thing. Why do we do good deeds? <clears throat> you know, there's an amazing Friends episode, I don't know if anyone's seen it, where Jerry and Phoebe are having a whole fight. Is there such a thing as a selfless good deed? Has anyone seen the episode? Any Friends fans here? Yeah, yeah, you've all seen the episode. Is there such a thing as a selfless good deed? I start what you say. Can one do a good deed which is really selfless? There is, yeah? Okay. What does Antigonus <laughs> Sopo says? He says something interesting. He says, when you do a good deed, there's two ways you can either do it. You either do it because you want to get the reward for it, or you do it because you really want to do it out of love for its own sake. So he says, don't just serve God like a servant who serves their master expecting the reward. Rather, you should do it without any expectation at all. And I thought this was a good point to speak briefly about the Jewish idea of reward and punishment which is a very difficult, complex topic, but I just want to share one or two ideas that um, relate to this Mishnah. You know, in Judaism, we believe that there is such a concept of a, of a selfless good deed. The quintessential example of that is Chesed Shem Emet, people who work, unfortunately, with the Hebrew Kedisha, that's the, the ultimate selfless good deed. They're not going to get anything back in return. It's all done completely anonymously. That is the ultimate example. But really, we believe in Judaism, and this is, go for it, the more religious you are, the more you know that a good deed, even if it makes you worse off, gives you a spiritual reward. So there is some, so it's not entirely selfless. Correct. Correct. There's kind of a paradox. Correct. That you get, you the know, Gemara discusses just this very deep concept, and the Gemara actually says, something that you do for the wrong reasons, eventually you'll do it for the right reasons. Right? In other words, yeah, you're right. There are people who... They do certain, they make certain lifestyle choices because, well, they want to, whatever it may be. But they later discover that it was for a better reason. You're right. And there are people who are religious because they fear God and they just do it because, you know, they want to make sure they get rewards in the world to come. Is that the best reason? No. The ultimate level, Maimonides talks about this, the ultimate level is doing it totally out of love. Are we all on that level? Definitely not. Something we aspire to. But this is different. The, the Gemara that says, the Gemara that says that if, if you do it, saying... I'm going to do this mitzvah so that I get a reward in the world to come, mm. is not considered doing it purely selflessly. Oh. But it's still there, great. There is that distinction. I mean, that's what the Gemara says. There is a distinction between doing it selflessly and doing it so you get a reward in the world to come. And that's a very primary distinction between the Ju Judaism and the other Abrahamic monotheisms. No, no, I'm not even saying that you're, you're doing it totally for that reason. I'm saying... Even if you do it and it makes you worth, you do it out of complete love. If you're if you're a from Jew, you know that you kind of know that it, it will bring you a reward anyway eventually. What's the there's no way of getting purpose? out of the, of the But what's the underlying purpose? Mm -hmm. I think I think it's very important to say, even if you are religious, like I was brought up religious my whole life, 
as was my wife Dina, as was Yossi, as was some other people in the room. We've always been religious, um, but, but that doesn't mean we don't have challenges with what we do and when we do it and why we do it. Of course we do. That is just different challenges. What, what's very important to understand, and this is the biggest barrier with people taking on more with Judaism, in my view, is when it comes to taking on more of Judaism, it's what I call the all or nothing syndrome. Right? Mm. Either I'm going to do everything or I'm not doing any more. Mm. And that's really not what Judaism is. Every single time you do a mitzvah in Judaism, it's as if you've received a beautiful diamond. If I was to say to you, I'm filling up this beautiful room from floor to ceiling with diamonds, pearls, gold, and jewelry. Here's a bin liner. You have 30 seconds. Go for it. Take as much as you want. You're not going to throw the bin liner in my face. Say, no, Rabbi, I'm not going to have time to take everything, so I'm not going to bother. You'd be a fool to say that. You'd grab a few handfuls, and after 30 seconds, you'd walk out of there with hundreds of thousands of pounds of valuables. Because within a few seconds and a few handfuls, it's the same with mitzvah. Every time you do a mitzvah, it's like you've grabbed another diamond. Every time you make a bracha, every time you light Shabbat candles, you visit the, the, the sick, you, you, look, you honor the elderly, you honor your parents, whatever it may be, we believe in Judaism. Every single mitzvah you do is a diamond, and it's an eternal diamond. And that's a really, really fundamental belief in Judaism, and, and people often see it as a barrier. Well, I'm not going to ever keep Shabbat, so I'm not even going to try not to be on my phone on Friday night. No, because just doing that for a few hours is better than not doing it altogether. Just trying to push yourself out of your comfort zone on whatever level you feel able to. It's a shame we've got such bad examples. Pardon? It's a shame we have such bad examples as well. And I'm talking about the ultra, ultra, ultra orthodox, Daredi ish, sorry to put the name of it, who would take it to such an extreme, such a beautiful thing you've just said. I love the idea of taking a few diamonds and I love to do what I can do. It's a beautiful example. But they make everyone else scared. Because they we get, get to that, another that extra, extra, extra mark. We're going to talk in a couple of minutes about not making judgments on other people. And, and no, <laughs> no, 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 I'm not talking about you making judgments on them, I'm talking about them making judgments on, ah, okay. on, on okay. us okay. as well. Okay. And that's a really, really, <laughs> really important question. No, no, I must tell you, I must tell you, I often hear this as well in the classroom, the kids say, yeah, but those religious Jews, I was in Israel and Mesha Arim walking and they spat at me and they threw buckets of waste at me and I was like, really? How many times did this happen once? Well, there was a friend of mine who once told me that their older brother happened on tour to them. I never saw it myself, but I heard it. Right? I, I would say it's 0.00% of the population. And really, go do a study and see the amount of charity organizations and wonderful things that go on in this world. Even in, in, in those reasons, all we get to see are the murky, miserable documentaries on the BBC and Channel 4 that make them out to look really bad, which is not reflective of who they really are. Yes, I'm not denying there are terrible things that go on in every community. Of course. Of course, and no one has got forbid trying to put anything under the carpet. There are things that shouldn't happen. Absolutely. But there's a lot of good things that do happen as well. And um, it's just food for thought. Yeah, that put me in my place, food, food for thought. Okay. <laughs> so, so that is, that is Antigonus. Yes. That is Antigonus. They're human, absolutely. Everyone is human. Okay, so that's reward and punishment. We're going to try and get through a few more Mishnah up before we, we end. Mishnah 4. Volunteer to read. Keith, thanks so much. Mishnah 4. <laughs> Go for English, go for English, everyone can hear. English. Yossi ben Yossi is a man of Zelaya, and Yossi ben Yossi is a man of Jews on the sea, the old tradition, and then, Shem Aishim, the life of the man of Jews. Yossi ben Yossi used to say, let thy house be a house of meeting for the sages, and sit in the very dust of their feet, and drink in the word of God. Ah, okay, beautiful. So the critic would say, well, this was written by a rabbi, so they would say that, wouldn't they? But actually... You know, I was discussing this with today with Dina. We were, we, I was preparing this. She was uh, my, my sounding board and listening to this discussion. What, what is going on in this Mishnah? This Mishnah is telling us the respect in which Judaism holds the sages. And always has. Always, always has. And, and, and the Mishnah is telling us that one's home should be used for precisely events like this. This is what Judaism is about. Having a lovely home is in order to be able to have guests and in order to facilitate Torah learning and to be using it for these type of things. But I think really what goes further is the idea of this Mishnah is the idea of enthusiasm. If you are enthusiastic about your Judaism, other people will be enthusiastic as well. You know, I had a guy who I knew, he came to seek me for some advice. Religious guy, always been religious. Three kids, none of whom wanted anything to do with Judaism. And he wanted some advice. And I was talking to him and it came out in the conversation <coughs> He's a very unenthusiastic person in everything that he does. 
<laughs> and quite a negative person. And his Shabbat table, it's not a fun place to be around. There's not a lot of positive energy there. And I was discussing with this idea, if you want your kids to love Shabbat, to love Friday night, you've got to make it fun. You've got to make it interactive. You've got to be saying smirat, making it lively, enjoyable, games, activities, whatever it may be. This is what this mission is talking about. In order for, for, for people to really love Judaism, you've got to make it that people are thirsty for it. Torah, by the way, is compared to water. Why is Torah compared to water? Because you can't live without it, right? Why do we read the Torah every three days? How many times a week do Jews read Torah? Three. Four. Four. Shabbos morning, Shabbos minicha, Monday and Thursday. The reason why we read it every third day, basically, is because you can't go three days without Torah in your life. Torah is like water. Like you wouldn't be able to survive three days without water, without, without satiation, so too... That is what Torah is supposed to be. And that's what your home is supposed to be. And you're supposed to try and connect yourself with, with, that, with that line of thinking. Moving on to mission number five. Chase. You want to read us mission number five? Go for it. Lovely. <laughs> Yossi Ben Yochum used to say, let, the, let, the, let thy house be wide open, and let the poor be members of, the, of thy household. Now, b- before you stone me in the next bit he's going to read, let me explain it. Go for it. <laughs> Engage not in too much conversation with women. Oh, I agree with that one. Keep on going. They said this with regard to one's own wife. How much more does the rule apply with regard to another man's wife? From here, <laughs> from here the sages said, as long as a man engages in too much conversation with women, he causes evil to himself. He neglects the study of the Torah, and in the end, he will inherit Gehenim. Now I can see um, Beverly's blood pressure going up. Yeah. So I'm, going to, <laughs> I'm going to clarify what this Mishnah says. This is actually, people love Pirkei Avot when they get to this Mishnah. It's so happy and fuzzy, it's so nice, you've said such wonderful things, and then you get to this Mishnah and think, oh God, this is Judaism, right? Let me clarify and explain. I actually discussed this with a bunch of scholars over the last week, because I knew when I got to this Mishnah, it would present challenge. <laughs> but let me yeah. tell you, I had a beautiful idea, and I think this is really what it means. There is absolutely no problem conversing one with another. With man and woman, absolutely no problem. The problem is when it turns into a session of inappropriate conver- conversing. When men and women start talking in a lewd fashion about topics that are inappropriate. And I'll bring you a proof that this is what the Mishnah is referring to, because for those of you who are able to look at the Hebrew, it says, Al Tabesicha im Ha'isha. It adds the letter He. And never is talking about the woman. In other words, matters of intimacy between a husband and wife and lewd topics that are not appropriate around the t- dinner table. They're not Shabbos table conversation. We live in a Love Island society, right? Now, I know in this house, I don't know whether I can say that, but we live in a society, we live in a society where people think it's okay to talk openly about things which are not okay to talk about, things that are private. We live with a certain sense of dignity, and the rabbis are reminding us don't forget that. This is where we come from, and this is where we are going, and this is what's important. We do not adopt the Love Island mentality. And I've invited A.L. Booker to my house for Friday night dinner. But I'm yet to hear back from him, although I have invited him. But I, I, I think it's important, right? I think it's important that we try and understand who we are and where we come from, and we raise ourselves and hold ourselves in a certain esteem. It's not talking about men and women talking. Of course, that's not a problem. And it, that, it's, it's not like a misogynistic, you know, it's a man's world type mission. That's not where it's going, and that's not where it's coming from. So um, that is very, very important. And, and, and there's a posse that says, right, there's a posse, in gen- there's a posse that says, motso isha motso tov. You find a woman, you find goodness. Right? But there's another posse that says, right, when it talks about hot isha mami mother, that the, the woman can be more poisonous then death, but that verse is talking about, again, hot ish or the hay, lewd conversation, inappropriateness, litigiousness, talking about things that you shouldn't be speaking about in the public um, domain. And it's referring to immoral, inappropriate talk. So that is that, Mishnah. Um, generally speaking, one should be very careful how they speak in general, what they speak about, with who they speak about it, um, and, and what's said publicly and what's not said publicly. Okay, how are we doing for time? What's the time? It's 10 past 9. We're going to try and get through one more mission, I think. I think I'm going to yeah. call it an evening. Yeah. And please, can I invite you to take this home, finish the parak, and we can carry on talking about it in your own time. Okay, so this is a beautiful mission to end on. Mission number six. Tabla. 
Go for anyone. Yeah. Any volunteers? Yeah, Joshua. 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 And I think this is nice to end on this, because this is real life advice, irrelevant now as it was two and a half thousand years ago. Asay lechor rav, make for yourself a teacher, or kene lechor and make sure you acquire for yourself friends. In other words, friendship is so important, even if you need to buy a friend, you need friends, you need community, and you need people around you. That's a really, really important idea. And the last one, which we'll talk about in a minute, Judge every person favorably. Now, there's a beautiful marshal told, there's a beautiful allegory told of a guy who's feeling very ill. He's feeling unwell. So he goes, instead of going to the doctor, he goes to the pharmacy. And he buys every medicine there is. And the pharmacist says, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm not well, so I'll just buy everything and something will work. The pharmacist says, are you crazy? You go to the doctor, and the doctor will prescribe for you the medication that you need. It's the same with Judaism. It's not pick and choose, although we live in a consumer society, you take what you take, what tastes good, no, you need a rabbi, you need a teacher, and then you're able to see what you really need, what you need to work on, what, you're challenge, what you need to do to challenge yourself. I say look around, make for yourself a teacher. You know, in, uh, in this document I had Dilopians, who was one of my teachers, but in the handout, my real Rosh Yeshiva, the one who was the rabbi in my yeshiva, was Rabbi Dabni Alefeld, who was is a huge Torah giant. I mean, he's finished the whole of Talmud, and he finishes it again and again every two years. And he's incredible. And I phoned him every Friday. Why? Because when I left Yeshiva, I said, Rabbi, I want to stay in touch with you. So he said, well, stay in touch. So I said, okay, I will. I'm going to phone you on Fridays. And 16 years later, every single Friday, <laughs> I call him, and we have a conversation. Because this is what the Mishnah is saying. You need someone in your life who is your yardstick, someone who's your sounding board, someone to ask advice from, and, and that's really the continuation of this Masorah that we started with this evening. Yeah, it's a transition from Moses down to you, but you want to be able to pass that baton on to your children. And therefore, if you don't take it seriously and have someone who's a role model to you, how are you going to be able to pass that on with integrity to the next generation? So that's our Seine Chorav. The second one is Kenei Chaver, quiet yourself with your friends. As we said, surrounding yourself with good people, with positive influences. One of the Mishnah that we didn't get through tonight says that if you have a bad neighbor, it has an effect on you. When you go through duty-free, right? I'm sure Chase and Aaron, you can relate to this, right? You go to Chase, you try on all the aftershaves, yeah? Yeah, now, when I go through duty-free, Dina, I must say, she's checking out some of the perfumes, hinting which ones she's quite fancy, right? Whatever happens, I walk out of there smelling of perfume. Even though I didn't put anything on, right? You walk into a spice shop, you walk out smelling of spice, right? You are affected by those people around you. You surround yourself with good people, it rubs off on you. And the same is so true with, with, with teenagers as well. You get into the right crowd of friends, that has a huge impact into who you, got, you become. That's what it means. And lastly, to conclude, the Mishnah ends that you should judge each and every person favorably. And I'll end with one of my most favorite stories. There's a story of a businessman. He's traveling on a trip, and he goes to the airport. And he's sitting in the departure lounge, and he goes into Smith's, he buys some biscuits and a drink, and he's sitting there with his Walker's biscuits, which incidentally are kosher, by the way. And he takes out a biscuit, he's sitting there reading his newspaper, and he's eating a biscuit, and he notices that there's a lady, an older lady, sitting on the other side of the bench. And she looks at him and smiles, and she picks up a box of biscuits, and she takes out a biscuit. And he thinks, what a chutzpah, who is this woman? <laughs> and he looks at her, he takes another biscuit, she takes one, and he's like thinking, my biscuits, what's happening? Before he knows it, there's one biscuit left in the packet. She looks at him and smiles. She picks up, she breaks it up in half and hands him half a biscuit and then leaves. And he stands up in anger and storms off in a huff. He gets to the plane and as he pulls out his passport from his bag, he finds a complete box of biscuits. What happened? This woman, who he thought was this selfish, horrible, thieving, terrible woman, was actually the nicest, most generous, sweetest lady. It had turned out it was her biscuits. And he had been taking her biscuits, and he thought that he'd taken his biscuits out of the bag, but he still did have his whole unopened packet of biscuits. We go through life and we judge people, and we make very instant judgments. The missionary is telling us, reserve your judgments. Don't make judgments on people too quickly, whether they're Haredi, 
whoever they are, wherever they come from, reserve your judgments okay, you judgment. till you are in that situation. Thank you so much for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, a quick judgment. That was undoubtedly the best cheer that I've actually ever attended. Yes, so well done, fantastic. Should we say Kaddish or not? Well, we can only make sure that we're not saying Yes, the Zakkas is Yisrael. The Fika here by the Hem Torah and Mitzvah Shene Emar as the night of Beit Zman Sifkar Yachdil Torah. Okay, you guys know, yeah. Yiskadal, Yiskadal, Shemer Abba. Yom Mavrokutei, Yom Mechmachutei, B'Chayichon, B'Yom 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 Mechmachutei, B'